Tabor family. And we want to welcome you to SJC's online worship experience. Well, glad you're here, everybody. Let's, Let's do, do this. this. Well, for the last few weeks, we've been exploring a message series called Go Ahead. It's a study in the letter of 2 Corinthians. And we've been exploring how it is that the gospel helps us to go ahead in life. Uh, and we're going to continue that journey today as we explore the topic of generosity. How is it that God wants to build in me uh, a generous life? Uh, welcome, everybody, to SJC's online worship experience. We're so excited that you're with us today. If you're new, we want to welcome you. So glad you've connected with us. And we are going to have an incredible time of prayer, worship, time in God's Word. So let's get ready to do it, everybody. Grace to you and peace from God, our Father, and the Lord Jesus Christ. The mercy of the Lord is everlasting.
A reading from 2 Corinthians. As you excel in everything, in faith, in speech, in knowledge, in utmost eagerness, and in our love for you, so we want you to excel also in this generous undertaking. I do not say this as a command, but I am testing the geniusness of your love and the earnestness for others. For you know the generous act of our Lord Jesus Christ, that through he was rich, yet for your sakes he became poor, so that his poverty you might become rich. And in this matter I am giving you my advice. It is appropriate for you who began last year not to do something, but even to desire to do something. Now finish doing it, so that your eagerness may be matched by com um, completing it according to your means. For if the eagerness is there, the gift is acceptable according to what one has, not according to what one does not have. I do not mean that there should be relief for others and pressure on you, but it is a question of a fair balance between your present abundance and their need, so that their abundance may be for your need, in order that there may be a fair balance, as is written. The one who had much did not have too much, and the one who had little did not have too little. The word of the Lord.
A reading from Mark. When Jesus had crossed again in the boat to the other side, a great crowd gathered around him, and he was by the sea. Then one of the leaders of the synagogue named Jairus came, and when he saw him, fell at his feet and begged him repeatedly, My little daughter is at the point of death. Come and lay your hands on her so that she may be well and live. So he went with him. And a large crowd followed him and pressed in on him. Now there was a woman who had been suffering from hemorrhages for 12 years. She had endured much under many physicians and had spent all of that she had, and she was no better, but rather grew worse. She had heard about Jesus and came up behind him in the crowd and touched his cloak. For she said, if I but touch his clothes, I will be made well. Immediately her hemorrhages stopped and she felt in her body that she was healed of her disease. Immediately aware that the power had gone forth from him, Jesus turned about in the crowd and said, who touched my clothes? And his disciples said to him, you see the crowd pressing in on you. How can you say who touched me? He looked all around to see who had done it, but the woman, knowing what had happened to her, came in fear and trembling, fell down before him and told him the whole truth. He said to her, Daughter, your faith has made you well. Go in peace and be healed of your disease. While he was still speaking, some people came from the leader's house to say, Your daughter is dead. Why trouble the teacher any further? But overhearing what they said, Jesus said to the leader of the synagogue, Do not fear, only believe. He allowed no one to follow him except Peter, James, and John, the brother of James. When they came to the house of the leader of the synagogue, he said a commotion, or he saw a commotion, people weeping and wailing loudly. When he had entered, he said to them, Why do you make a commotion and weep? The child is not dead, but sleeping. And they laughed at him. Then he put them all outside and took the child's father and mother and those who were with him and went in where the child was. He took her by the hand and said to her, Talitha kum, which means little girl, get up. And immediately the girl got up and began to walk about. She was 12 years of age. At this, they were overcome with amazement. He strictly ordered them that no one should know this and told them to give her something to eat. The word of the Lord. Well, all right, we continue with our series in 2 Corinthians called Go Ahead. And what we're paying close attention to in Paul's letter to Corinth is how we move forward as God's people through the many challenges that life presents us. How can we go ahead and specifically, what is it about the gospel that is our hope in Jesus that pushes us forward in faith, that moves the mission of the kingdom forward through the church, through the body of Christ. Uh, so far, we've explored how the gospel helps us go ahead because, of course, God is, first of all, with us. And we can go ahead uh, as well because through the gospel, we have an eternal future, providing a life-changing perspective toward the infinite game of the gospel. Last week, we explored that we could go ahead with wide open hearts because of the freedom that we have in Christ. Today, we're going to talk about how our relationship with Jesus helps us go ahead uh, in a life of generosity. One of the implications of our gospel freedom is to become generous givers. We become generous givers as we understand that in Christ, we're the unworthy recipients of a lavish love from God. As John wrote in 1 John 3, see what kind of love the Father has lavished on us that we should be called the children of God. The ability or the desire, the, the willingness to practice generosity then, uh, to be generous with our lives, actually comes out of a security of being loved like that. The gospel helps us grow into the kind of generous lifestyle that should characterize a people who actually understand themselves as having been infinitely loved and forgiven, uh, given freedom and security. Growing up, my mom owned and operated two independent bookstores in our town, which often required moving inventory from one store to the other. And when I became a driver in high school, mom would occasionally ask me to take a load from the downtown store to the other location 
on the new side of town. Of course, I always did what mom asked of me. She's my mom and she's the best. But I can't say in honesty that I always did it with joy. I distinctly remember after having become a follower of Jesus, however, being home from college during a busy holiday season when my mom asked if I would load some boxes of inventory and take them across town. And I found myself saying sure in a new kind of way. And what I noticed was an inward change of perspective about doing this simple thing. I was honored to serve my mom, uh, to give my time joyfully as a blessing to someone else. Now, I know this is no world-changing story by any stretch, but in that moment, uh, for me personally, I recognized in myself that something had changed, something was different. What I used to hate doing before became a joyful opportunity to serve. Now, don't think I'm touting a perfect heart of generosity here. I don't always serve with joy, just ask my family. I have to warm my heart by the fire of Christ's generosity over and over and over again. But the point is, Jesus changes our perspective when it comes to serving, when it comes to sharing and giving. He opens us to a lifetime of generosity because he, of course, is the generous king. And life with Jesus is... Uh, it's like a life in a family of generosity. The biblical generosity is way more than financial giving. It feels more like being welcomed into someone's home for supper. Generosity is when someone takes the time to listen to you, to get to know you. It's like hospitality. I was talking recently to one of our leaders uh, at the church, and we were talking about what it was that makes our story night event for newcomers so special and we kept coming back to this idea of generous hospitality, authentic relationship building. Uh, this generosity with our lives uh, is involved in giving, but it's deeper than that. It's giving with a relational dynamic. God doesn't share creation without sharing himself as well. He doesn't make anonymous donations. That's why when we try to understand the world or ourselves in the world apart from God, we struggle. God's generosity without God is actually a recipe for futility. There's a very real context to this idea of generosity in our passage of Scripture today in 2 Corinthians. The mostly Jewish Christians in Jerusalem were experiencing extreme persecution. Many were economically ostracized because of their faith in Jesus. Because of this, they were in desperate shape. Paul's missionary journeys and work with various churches in Macedonia and Asia Minor and the surrounding region allowed him the opportunity, along with his associates like Titus, to encourage a collection of funds among these churches to aid the beleaguered believers in Jerusalem. What made this even more extraordinary was the image of unity in the gospel. Most of the churches outside of Jerusalem were, of course, dominated by Gentile converts to the Christian faith. So the offering was not only a much needed source of monetary relief, it was also a picture of the supernatural unity of the body of Christ. That is, both Jew and Gentile together as one people, caring for one another. It's hard for us in our pluralistic, multicultural, modern world to understand the power of this witness in the ancient world, a unity that could only happen through a miracle of grace. The church actually stood out as a multi-ethnic transnational body. It was the new community of the new covenant where all classes of people, male and female members, were both children and adults, slaves and free, servants and masters, were all level at the foot of the cross. They were all equal in dignity and purpose and importance. All sinner saints loved by God in the same way. In a landscape dominated by a strict class system, this was truly a revolutionary society. One of the hallmarks of the Christian church in the New Testament era and of God's people from the beginning was the culture of generosity that characterized them. Famously, we're given a picture of the church in Acts chapter 2 that captures the genesis of spirit-driven generosity. They committed themselves, it says, uh, to the teaching of the apostles, the life together, the common meal, the prayers. Everyone around was in awe. All those wonders and signs done through the apostles and all the believers lived in a wonderful harmony, holding everything in common. They sold whatever they owned and pooled their resources so that each person's need was met. They followed a daily discipline of worship in the temple, followed by meals at home, every meal a celebration, exuberant and joyful as they praised God. People in general liked what they saw. Every day their number grew as God added to those who were being saved. Jesus described this culture of generosity to his disciples in the Sermon on the Mount in Matthew chapter 5. He said this, Now that I've put you there on a hilltop, on a light stand, shine. 
Keep open house. Be generous with your lives. By opening up to others, you'll prompt people to open their hearts up to God, this generous Father in heaven. You see, Paul's exhortation to the church in Corinth was to be part of this generous response to the suffering saints in Jerusalem. In fact, they had started out well, uh, setting aside a collection at their weekly gatherings of worship, but somewhere along the way, their zeal for this work had waned. Uh, Paul is asking them in this letter then to stay the course. He says to them, you do so well in so many things. You trust God. You're articulate. You're insightful. You're passionate. You love us. Now do your best in this thing as well. The church in Corinth had high standards for other areas of ministry that valued, for example, excellence in teaching and growing in God's wisdom. Now Paul wants them to cultivate a similar passion in their generosity. To inspire them, Paul shares how the churches in Macedonia, not nearly as wealthy as the church in Corinth, uh, they had nonetheless contributed faithfully to this collection effort at great cost and sacrifice to them. It wasn't the amount that they collected that was important. It was the heart and sacrifice behind it. Paul tells the Corinthians, your heart's been in the right place all along. You've got what it takes to finish it up, so go to it. Once the commitment is clear, you do what you can, not what you can't. The heart, Paul writes, regulates the hands. Listen to Paul's words again. Don't let them pass you by. He says, once the commitment is clear, you do what you can, not what you can't. The heart regulates the hands. You see, as a church, it's more important than ever to clarify our purpose and our vision. When we can see our purpose with clarity, we can give ourselves to that direction. But if our purpose is unclear or our vision is muddled somehow, generosity gets stagnant. No one can confidently contribute to an organization that lacks clarity of purpose and defined direction. Jesus gave us such missional clarity uh, in his words to his disciples. Tell the world about my love. Disciple all nations, baptize in the name of the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. Paul's vision was to establish churches, equip the saints, take the gospel to the uttermost ends of the earth. That was the vision. Jesus is the vision. Hope of the world, hope for our community, hope for our neighbors, coworkers, and friends. But it starts with clarity of mission, clarity of purpose, a defined direction. Over the last several years, the leadership at SJC has prayed, dreamed, and worked diligently to refine and shape our vision and mission. The vision, unchanging good news for all. The mission, helping others discover their purpose through the gospel of Jesus Christ. From the first breath of life to the last, with babies uh, and our elder members and everybody in between, our passion is to see people encounter Jesus and discover their purpose through a relationship with Him. We believe that as we do this, God is glorified, lives are transformed, our community is changed, and the church grows in love and in joy and in generosity. I love what Paul says next. Not only is clear commitment important, but we all have different roles to play in the generosity in the body of Christ. Uh, in 1 Corinthians, Paul uses the metaphor of the body to describe the church. I think it's really Paul teasing out Jesus' original use of this metaphor with his disciples in the upper room when Jesus says, this is my body broken for you. On our recent family vacation to the Outer Banks, I was body surfing. That's my action sport, y'all. Uh, something I love doing when I'm at the ocean. And I got rolled up into this huge and powerful wave that actually drove my left shoulder hard into the ocean floor. And I suffered a deep uh, contusion in my shoulder. And the first 48 hours were a stark reminder of the wonder of the body's connected parts. For one thing, a body part I never normally thought much about was screaming at me nonstop, my shoulder. In the pain, I remembered that I had a shoulder, uh, that, a shoulder that I had mostly taken for granted. Secondly, I noticed how the rest of my body did whatever it could to make up for the lack my shoulder was experiencing. I think even my small toe was trying to help. My body was ministering where there was a need. In the poverty of my wounded shoulder, the rest of my body was trying hard to pick up the slack. Here's what Paul tells the church in Corinth about the interdependence they have with their brothers and sisters in the body of Christ, all the way over to the brothers and sisters in Jerusalem. He says, this isn't so others can take it easy while you sweat it out. No, you're shoulder to shoulder with them all the way. Your surplus matching their deficit, their surplus matching your deficit. In the end, you come out even. 
Again, Paul says, your surplus matching their deficit, their surplus matching your deficit. What an incredible picture that is. You see, when the church is operating as a community of self-giving, when by the spirit a culture of generosity marks us, it's like a beautiful symphony where each of us has something to contribute to the music. In the broad categories of time, treasure, and talent, Paul is saying, you give what you can, that's what the Spirit directs you to do, not what you can't. We're all called to be generous with our whole selves. That's the context of who we are in Christ. We've become givers through the one who gave everything for us. But each individual member of the body of Christ has what I call a subtext to the context. The subtext is how the Spirit is shaping, calling, and inviting you to follow Jesus by faith in the specific ways that are particular to God's journey to you, wired to your personality. As Paul says, the heart regulates the hands. As you may know at SJC, we're bonkers about Vacation Bible School. We just love it. We love that ministry every summer. And we always need an army of volunteers. Each year, it's amazing to see uh, who God brings alongside to serve. We recently received an email from one of our members who said that they were blocking off all of their appointments for a whole week so that they could give their time serving at VBS. That's generosity. That's giving up a week of your professional livelihood to pour the love of Christ into the hearts of kids at Vacation Bible School. How awesome. That's where a particular person's uh, ability to contribute comes in. That's the heart regulating the hands. That's a specific calling in the subtext of someone's life. It will bless the lives of others. I could share a thousand different stories of people in the church who are responding to the Holy Spirit to give of themselves generously, to give of their time and of their gifts and of their financial resources. Here's the thing, the incredible mystery and reality of all this. When you're generous, it goes to make up a lack from somewhere else. When others are generous, they are making up a similar lack in us or in others. Invariably, there are parents who can't afford to take a week off to serve at VBS, and that's okay. Guess what? They have other ways to contribute and to serve and to give. They have their own subtext in which the Holy Spirit will lead them. And that's the beauty of being led of God in the body of Christ. This means that generosity should humble us. It means that we need one another. It means that generosity is not a one-way street. No one is self-sufficient. Paul says he's asking the Corinthians to participate in this specific collection for the church in Jerusalem because in the economy of God's generosity, it's fair. To be clear, this has nothing to do with some sort of campaign to drain the wealth of the Corinthian church. For Paul, it's a beautiful opportunity to love the church in Jerusalem, which has a severe lack because of persecution. But what Jerusalem lacks in economic resources, it makes up for in the spiritual resources of gospel leadership, which it has not failed to share with the churches all over the region, including the church of Corinth. It's like the old folktale uh, story, Stone Soup, when the local church embraces the culture of giving, when every man, woman, and child understands their call as a follower of Jesus to cultivate a generous life, the capacity of the church to nourish others grows exponentially, and the flavor of the church's witness begins to explode in a community. When you and I are not generous, the church becomes bland and obsessed with scarcity. When we understand the gospel, then, uh, we truly understand uh, that is the weight of our lack. Uh, we'll also begin to see our unique resources that we do have and the privilege of being able to give ourselves away to the blessing of others. Like the church in Corinth, we're prone to grow stale in generosity. Maybe it's because we get distracted or disconnected or discouraged. Maybe we've personally drifted from Christ somehow, or maybe as a church, we've forgotten our vision and mission. When we fail to keep Jesus central, we lose sight of the very reason that we can go ahead in generosity. Paul says it powerfully. He says, quote, you're familiar with the generosity of our master, Jesus Christ. Rich as he was, he gave it all away for us. In one stroke, he became poor and we became rich. Theologian N.T. Wright reflects on this in a powerful way. He says, quote, when Jesus, for the sake of us all, became poor, we became rich. Now when people who follow him are ready to put their resources at his disposal, the world and the church may benefit, not only from the actual money, but from the fact that when the Jesus pattern of dying and rising, of riches to poverty to riches is acted out, the power of the gospel is let loose. 
afresh in the world and the results will be incalculable. Are we putting our resources at Jesus' disposal? Are we still in the small game of telling God what's ours and what's his? You see, in the gospel, it's clear it all belongs to him. We're merely caretakers. So how is the Spirit working in you? How is the Spirit calling you, challenging you toward a generous life? Maybe the COVID season has you a little off rhythm. Maybe there are areas where you once actively served or financial contributions that you were making previously that you just fell away from. Maybe you used to serve in a ministry and it went dormant. Here's what I would encourage you to do. This is a season for a fresh start. This is a time for us all to ask God to lead us in new ways of generosity. It's time to look forward to see where you can get involved and to go ahead. Go ahead in bold financial giving. Go ahead in the investment of your time for the sake of others. Go ahead in generously offering your gifts as an expression of Christ's love through you. You see, your generosity is so needed. It may not always seem that way or appear that way, but God never wastes the gifts and the efforts and the contributions offered up in his name. Maybe today you're watching this and you just feel like you're a thousand miles from thinking about giving. You feel so depleted and empty. You can't even imagine having resources to give to yourself, much less give out to others. The good news is that Jesus became poor to share all of his love with you. And he did this to share all of the riches of his grace with you. An infinite supply of everything you need to be the very person that God created you to be. It's what Jesus meant, I think, in the Gospels when he told people that, in fact, he was the living bread that satisfies our hunger and that he would provide living water that pours forth and satisfies us. He promised a life of abundance. Generosity starts with Jesus. New life, new hope, deep down joy and lasting peace begins when we receive his generous love. Maybe today, right now, you would open your heart to receive this from this generous Savior. Let's let's pray together. Jesus, thank you for your generosity in the face of my poverty, the poverty of my sin, my brokenness, my own stubbornness. You gave all of yourself for me on the cross. In your death, my sin was paid. In your resurrection, my life becomes abundant. I receive now, Lord, your generous gift. Teach me to trust you, to follow you by faith, and help me Uh, to lead a life of gratitude, to be generous, Jesus, just like you. Thank you, Lord. Amen. What a fellowship, what a joy divine, leaning on the everlasting arms. What a blessed See
who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not, not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory, forever and ever. Amen. Well, it certainly is profound and amazing when we think about the fact that our God is a giver, that he is a sharer, everything that he's done for us in creation and in salvation um, is a display of his self-giving heart, uh, his sharing heart, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. Amazing love. What a, what a day for us and an opportunity for us today to rejoice in his love and to revel and to give thanks for his generosity. We want to encourage you to follow Jesus uh, in living a generous life. Uh, and certainly that involves more than finance. It's time, it's treasure, uh, it's talent, it's giving our whole selves um, to Christ and allowing the Holy Spirit to lead us uh, in the areas that he's calling us to serve, uh, to give our time, uh, and to participate in sacrificial financial giving. Uh, we encourage you to do that all, at every level. Uh, each of us, that's our calling uh, as followers of Jesus together. Uh, and when we do that together, as we talked about in our sermon today, uh, incredible things happen. The flavor uh, of the soup of the church, if you will, uh, just explodes uh, and it becomes a sweet savor in a community. That's our passion to help others discover uh, their purpose through the gospel of Jesus Christ. You can continue to support the work of the mission and vision of here at SJC financially by simply mailing in a check to the address at the bottom of the screen. You can give online by going to our website and hitting the giving button. It's easy to do. It's safe and secure. You could also give by text in a safe and secure way. Simply uh, enter the number at the bottom of the screen and follow the prompts along. Any and every gift is so appreciated. Uh, we want to challenge you to be a giver, to be a generous giver. So God bless you today as you give generously.
made of one blood all the peoples of the earth and sent your blessed Son to preach peace to those who are far off and to those who are near. Grant that people everywhere may seek after you and find you. Bring the nations into your fold, pour out your spirit upon all flesh, and hasten the coming of your kingdom. Through Jesus Christ our Lord. Amen. Let us say together the general thanksgiving. Almighty God, Father of all mercies, we, your unworthy servants, give you humble thanks for all your goodness and loving kindness to us and to all whom you have made. We bless you for our creation, preservation, and all the blessings of this life, but above all, for your immeasurable love. In the redemption of the word, world by our Lord Jesus Christ, for the means of grace and for the hope of glory, and we pray, give us such an awareness of your mercies that we will truly thankful hearts we may show forth your praise, not only with our lips, but in our lives. By giving up ourselves to your service and by walking before you in holiness and righteousness all of our days, through Jesus Christ our Lord, to whom with you and the Holy Spirit be honor and glory throughout all ages. Amen. Let us bless the Lord. Thanks be to God. The grace of our Lord Jesus Christ and the love of God and the fellowship of the Holy Spirit be with us all evermore. Amen. Well, what a joy and a comfort to know that generosity starts with Jesus, that God emptied himself uh, when he came to us in the person of Christ, uh, that we might become rich in him. Amazing love, amazing generosity. I hope you've been challenged and inspired, blessed and encouraged through our time of worship today. It's been a joy to be with you. If you're new with us, encourage you. Fill out one of our digital connect cards in the comment thread uh, as you watch along today. And we look forward to reaching out to you. Remember, as you go today, Jesus loves you. He really, really does. Uh, believe it, take that to heart. Uh, know that today. And friends, life is short. We don't have much time to gladden the hearts of those who travel with us. So let us be swift to love and make haste to be kind. Go in peace to love and serve the Lord. Thanks be to God. See you soon.